It's lovely to be here and speaking to everyone this afternoon. I've not yet made it to Poland, so hopefully I will have to add that to my list for when we're allowed to go and travel and visit different countries again. So without further ado, I think we will get started. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep, fantastic. Okay, brilliant. So what we're going to be talking about, as Natalia said, in this session is best practices for teaching young learners. And we're going to be using examples from two different series by National Geographic Learning. One of them is called Our World Second Edition and the other one is called Look. But we're going to be exploring within those different ideas for teaching young learners that are going to help us really get the most out of our students and to make sure that they are really achieving everything that they can do. And also hopefully make our lives as teachers a little bit easier as well. Now, this is going to be quite interactive. So I'm gonna ask you different questions at different points. And I'd like you to type the answers in the chat box if I ask you something, please. But obviously, as Natalia said at the beginning, if you do have a specific question about something, if you could please put that in the Q&A box. So you should have two different options. You've got a chat option and you've got a Q&A option just because it's easier for us to see the questions that are in the Q&A. Questions in the chat box tend to get missed because if a lot of people are contributing answers, um, it moves very, very quickly and I can't see very much of it at any one time. So that being said, let us get started. So I think really to get to grips with teaching young learners, first of all, and how we can get the most out of teaching them, we need to think about our students ourselves. So my first question to you is this, how would you describe young learners, probably your young learners, what kind of adjectives would you use to describe them? Any thoughts? Okay, so talkative, curious, creative, motivated, energetic, competitive. Uh-huh, good, I really like these ideas. Funny, uh-huh, fun, demanding, enthusiastic, impatient, uh-huh, eager to learn, focused. More, lots more people saying creative and energetic, easily bored, yeah, sometimes, and lazy as well. Yep, they can be, definitely. Easy to influence, noisy, dynamic, loud, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Really good adjectives there, really nice suggestions. Thank you. And I very much agree with everything that you have just said there. All of our young learners can be all of these different things, can't they? Now, some of these words that we've come up with, they're things that are quite positive, aren't they? Things like curious and creative, we would generally say are very positive traits. But then a few of the things that we've come up with, things like maybe having a short attention span or being noisy um, or being unfocused, those things are maybe a little bit more negative. But some of these words that we've come up with, they kind of match up, don't they? It depends on how we perceive them, whether or not we think that they are positive things or whether or not we think they are negative things. And that can depend a lot on the day or even on other things that are going on for us or for our students. So we could think that our students are loud or maybe actually they're social. They want to interact with each other, with us. They want to tell us things. They want to share things with their friends. We could think, well, they're really, really hyper today. Or maybe, just as lots of people said, they're energetic. And that's something that we can hopefully use to our advantage. They're easily distracted, which can make our lives really very difficult sometimes as teachers. If you've got a student who really wants to tell you something and it's nothing to do with what you want to do in the lesson, 
or they've got things that they really want to share with their friends and they're just not going to listen to you because they're thinking about too many other things. Or maybe they're curious. The reason why their attention is all over the place is because they're interested in so many different things. They can be silly, or as lots of you have said, they can be really good fun. And they can't sit still, or potentially they're just spontaneous. When they want to do something, they want to do it now. They could be eager, they can be enthusiastic. Now, obviously, we want to try and have as positive an attitude towards our young learners as possible. So it's worth us bearing in mind that at times, the way that we perceive them might be a bit more negative when we have a bad day, when we have a bad lesson, but actually those traits can be used to our advantage as well. So now that we've established a little bit about who our young learners are, we're gonna think about some guidelines that can help us to make sure we're getting the most out of them. And we're working with them to the best of those traits, to the best of those abilities, rather than to their detriment. So I'm gonna go over to you, first of all. And my question for you is, what do you think makes a good young learner lesson? So we've spoken a bit about our young learners and what they're like and what their personalities are. But what do we think makes a good young learner lesson? So Magdalena has said they can move. Yeah, definitely. Ah, short lesson. Yeah, definitely. We need to bear in mind that attention span, don't we? Well paced. Yeah, fun. It needs to be varied. Something that's interesting. Yeah, that's definitely really important. Something that's engaging. Definitely. Lots of colours. Uh-huh. Yeah. And games. New technology. Yep, that can definitely play a part. Thought-provoking activities, songs, TPR, relevant topics, playing roles, elements of surprise. Oh, I like that idea as well. That's, that's an interesting idea, definitely. Focusing on interaction, music. Brilliant. Thank you. Really, really nice ideas there. Fun. Yes, definitely. I think that needs to underpin everything that we do, their lessons. We want our young learner lessons to be fun. Okay, but yeah, I like your idea as well, Natalia, about having a balance of fun and real content. So it's making sure it's fun, but not just fun for the sake of it, that there are, is learning taking place as well. Okay, thank you very much for all of those ideas there. And thank you for all your participation so far. Well done, guys. You're being really interactive and that's great. It makes everything much more interesting with this webinar and it makes everything much smoother as well. So in this session, we're gonna look at five different areas. Now, obviously some of these might be things that you have mentioned. Some of these might be other things as well. And there are lots of things that you've mentioned that I can see that are really, really important that we're not going to talk about today simply because we don't have time. We only have a limited amount of time available to us. But the things that we're going to be talking about today are making our lessons enjoyable and interesting, making our lessons active and hands-on, making sure that our activities and the way that we structure things is supportive and scaffolded, ensuring that our content is meaningful and purposeful, and that our lessons are connected to the real world. So these are the five different areas that we're going to be looking at. And we're gonna take each of these in turn. So our first one that we're gonna be talking about today is this, enjoyable and interesting. So young learners, I think one of the first things you said to me is that young learners are curious. They want to know about the world around them, but they also have short attention spans. They're less likely to be motivated by internal factors. Their motivation is more likely to be external things like having fun. So what does this tell us about our young learner lessons? Well, it tells us that perhaps the most important thing that we need to consider 
is that our lessons are enjoyable and they're interesting and they are fun for our learners. So, my question to you again is, how do you do that? What do you already do in your classrooms to make your lessons enjoyable and to make them interesting? What do you already do? Okay, so Alexandra says use TPR games. Yeah, games and quizzes. Uh huh, drama. Yeah, I really like, I love using drama in the classroom. It's a really nice way to make things a bit different and to shake things up a bit. And it's often really helpful if you've got shy students to encourage them to speak a bit, doesn't it? Uh huh, laughing with them. Yep, lots of movement, playing roles. Having video based lessons, singing, another vote for games there. Creating a positive relationship with your students. I like that one, Martina. That's very important, definitely, to make sure that we create a positive rapport with our students. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Lots of really good ideas there. So we're going to go to our first of our examples for today and this is from the series Look. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with National Geographic photography. It's bright, it's bold, it's interesting and it captivates students attention. Now what I'd like you to tell me is if you had this picture or this page from this book in your lesson, what could you do with it to make it more interesting? So Obviously, lots of people have suggested things like using games and using songs and using music. But what could you do with this page or with this picture to make it interesting for your students? Aha, uh -huh. so yep, Sylvia is suggesting doing a slow reveal. Definitely, so we could cover up most of the picture and show a little bit of it at a time and we could potentially ask our students to guess what they can see in the picture. Yep, that's a really nice idea. Ah, yeah, we can guess what's behind a particular window. So what's happening that we can't see. Counting the windows, using colours, guessing games. Yep. How many floors are there? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, that's a nice idea, Katarzyna. So one person describes it, everyone else has to draw it. Definitely, we could cut into pieces and our students put the pictures together. Really nice ideas here, everyone. They're really good suggestions. Okay, so thank you for all of those ideas there. So some of the things that I came up with for what we could do with it. Oh, I'm just gonna read that one up because that's a really nice idea as well. So storytelling, we can ask, ask our students to guess who lives here and maybe what happened. So we can start with different kind of elements to this. We can start very, very simple. We could ask our students where they think this is. We can ask them, questions relating to their own experience. For example, would you like to go to this place? Why or why not? We can develop their critical thinking skills by encouraging them to use what they can see in the picture to guess where it is. Obviously it tells you on the picture that it's from, it is in Madrid in Spain. So we might want to cover that up before showing it to our students, but if we look at the picture, there are some clues that might tell us that it's there because we can see a Spanish flag over on the right hand side. We can also see it's very busy. There are lots of people, but in the sky, it's quite dark. So it must be quite late in the evening, for example. So we can tell that it's somewhere where people maybe don't go to bed very early. I know certainly in the UK, shops definitely wouldn't be open at this time. Our shops close very early. 
So we can ask our students to make predictions or to come up with their own ideas. We can also, if you look at the chart on the left, this is just a simple graphic organizer that we can use. And we could print one of these out from the extra resources, or we could simply get our students to draw something like this in their notebooks. But this is asking them to know, uh, asking them to tell us what they know about the picture already, or what they can see in the picture, what they want to know about it, and then at the end of the lesson, we can revisit it and they can tell us what they have learned about it. A slightly different way of phrasing it is to use this kind of structure. I know, I think, I wonder. So this is a very similar kind of structure to the what I know, what I want to know, what I've learned. But here it's what do I know? So what's a, a fact? So for example, um, it's very busy, there are lots of people. I think, so maybe what I just predicted that the sky looks quite dark, it's quite late at night. Um, and I wonder, so that would be like a hypothesis or an idea. So maybe I wonder what the people are buying. I wonder if they're all tourists or if some of them live here, for example. Now, these kinds of ideas, they just give a shape to what our students are thinking. They encourage them to develop these critical thinking skills, but they encourage them to actually think through these ideas and to justify these opin their opinions and to use their prior knowledge and their own experiences, relating it to what they can see. Now, all of this is worthwhile doing because it's great if we're going to then prepare our students to, for example, take any the exams, because young learner exams often want students to be able to talk about or describe a picture, for example. So although we can make it into a fun activity, we can make it into something our students are going to enjoy doing. It's a really useful activity as well. I've just seen Shemek has just put in the chat, I wonder why they aren't wearing masks. Yes, definitely. I think that's what I think at the moment when I watch any kind of television program or film or something. It's starting to seem quite odd now seeing people not wearing masks anymore. Now, if we do these kinds of activities where we encourage our students to come up with questions, we can make use of things like this. So in all the National Geographic Learning series, we have these about the photo boxes in the teacher's book. And this just gives the teacher some extra information that they can share with the students if they want to. And this potentially gives us a source of information to answer our students' questions because they might have come up with questions like these things. They might want to know how many people live in Madrid, for example, or they might want to know how long Madrid has been the capital of Spain or why it's the capital of Spain, for example. I know sometimes it's quite interesting finding out why the capitals of different, ta of different countries are those particular places and not other places. And we can also do things that are more creative with our picture. I really like some of the ideas that you came up with in the chat, things to do with maybe cutting the picture into different pieces and getting them to assemble it, or maybe drawing the picture and asking their classmates to guess what it is that they can see, for example, or storytelling, being creative, making up ideas about who lives in this place or maybe what happened before this picture was taken or what's going to happen after this picture was taken. Now, a really simple way we could do something like this is to add in a little speech bubble or a little thought bubble like the one I've just added there. And we can ask our students to guess what is this person thinking? Or if it's a speech bubble, what is this person saying? So does anyone have any ideas? What do you think this person is thinking? <laughs> they might be thinking wear your mask now. Yep, possibly. Any other thoughts about what they're thinking? Wow, 
whenever I do this activity, my, my first option is always, I better not spend too much money. I'm not quite sure what that says about me and shopping. But yeah, I need to visit my daughter. What shall I have for supper? Where am I again? It's getting a bit cold now, maybe. Yep. Oh, I forgot the bread. Yep, definitely. <laughs> ah, yeah, I like that idea as well. So the windows, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's a really nice point. And Sylvia, the, the windows in the shop, how did they make them all a different colour? That's a really good point. But yeah, why is it so crowded? Too many tourists, I'm going home now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much for all of those ideas, everyone. And what I really love about doing an activity like that is that everyone can interact with it in the way that they want to. So some of these things, people who have come up with are maybe quite practical, quite sort of they're thinking, OK, what would I think in that situation? And things like, how do I get to this place or what am I going to have for dinner? But then other people have come up with things that are maybe a little bit more out there. So like the, the one about how do they make the windows different colours, for example, or uh, wondering about what they're going to do next, for example. There's all different answers. And of course, there's no right or wrong answer to this sort of question. Our students can interact with it in all different ways. OK, now, one of the key ways that we can make lessons for young learners enjoyable and interesting is by using a wide range of different activities and different task types. So lots of you said at the beginning that young learn lessons ideally need to be short. Obviously, that's not necessarily something that we can control. In an ideal world, it would be nice if we could, but at times, we definitely work for schools or we work in contexts where the length of the lesson is set and maybe it's a bit longer than we would like it to be. But one of the ways that we can work with that is by making sure that we've got lots of different variety in terms of the activities that we do and that the activities that we do are short enough to work with our students' attention spans and that we've got lots of variety in what we're choosing to use. So I just wanted to share this page with you here because I think this is a really good example of making sure that we're doing lots of different types of activities, lots of different types of skills, even within one lesson. So nominally here, this is a reading lesson. You can see at the top of the page, it says reading, but we're not only practicing reading in this lesson. We've got listening in the first activity as well as reading. And of course, if we wanted to make this more challenging for our students, we could ask them to listen without having the text in front of them. So we're really practicing those listening skills um, and not letting them rely on reading it to get the information. Uh, we've got also writing. So we're not just going to be reading. We're also practicing those productive skills. And also you've got a speaking activity as well. So we've got all four skills within the one lesson. We've got listening, reading, writing and speaking all together. Now, obviously, it's not always practical to do all four skills in one lesson, but it's a really good idea to try and make sure that we're covering several different skills just so that our learners are practicing that language in as many different ways as possible and we're getting that variety in there. But it's not just about the types of activities that we do, it's also about the materials that we use. We want our schoolwork to be meaningful, both at school, but also outside of the school environment. We want material to be things that students can relate to because that's gonna help them to talk about it. So we need to make sure that the topics that we choose are going to be relevant, are going to be important, and are going to be interesting to our young learners. Now, it's also important that our students have the opportunity to personalise the language that they've learned and to connect it to real life contexts. And that's something we'll be talking about a little bit later on in the session today. 
But I wanted to share this quote with you because I think that it makes a really valid point that one of the ways that we can make our lessons engaging is by making sure that they're things that our students can actually relate to. If it's something that they already know a little bit about, that they can see how it relates to what they already know, it helps their mental kind of filing system, if you like, when new information is easily able to be related to existing information. So one of the ways we can do this, obviously, is by talking about different things, different topics and familiar topics that can be found in course books. That might be things such as technology, such as school, travel, holidays, hobbies and interests, the environment, home, fashion, entertainment, food, jobs. They're all things that we tend to find in our young learner course books. And there's a reason for this. It's because they're all familiar and they're things that students can relate to in one way or another. Learning a language using a thematic or topic based approach enables our learners to connect to the real world and what they're learning every day. And that's going to help them to stay motivated. So having topics and themes that our students can relate to is really important. But equally important is putting a bit of a spin on the theme, because, as we said, the majority of course books have the same kinds of topics. And in the first place, that's fine. But if you're in, say, grade five or six and you've had the same topics each year, although obviously your language is going to be better, the way that you're going to interact with it is going to be more advanced, etc., can get a little bit boring potentially can't it if you think oh we're doing food again we already did food we did food last year we did food the year before it's always the same topics but we can put a bit of a spin on it by showing our learners different aspects of it we can show them for example maybe what things look like in different places around the world or show them different angles that they might not have experienced of it. So by making sure that we're still covering the language that we need to use, but we're showing it in different ways. We're showing our students different aspects to it, different elements, different experiences of those same topics. Now, we'll look a little bit more about how we can use video later, but video can be a great tool to do this. A few people mentioned using videos earlier. I think one of the things that's so amazing about technology and video is that we have access to so many different things, don't we? And we can use it as a tool to show our young learners more of the world they live in beyond their immediate surroundings. So in the videos that go with Look, for example, there are real children from different countries all around the world, including one from Poland, um, who are being interviewed about different things to do with their everyday lives. Um, and they're talking about their own experience, but it also shows footage of those different countries, those different places, the different things that they talk about. So we can see one there that's talking about cities, in their town, um, in their country, sorry. We've got one that's talking about school and different lessons, and one here that's talking about festivals and celebrations. They're all very familiar topics, but we're allowing our students almost to have an experience a little bit similar to what they would have in a multilingual, multicultural classroom where they're seeing what things are like in different places all around the world and hearing real children talking about their lives and their experiences as well. Now, we know that our young learners have a lot of energy, don't they? Lots of people have said they've got lots of energy, they're loud, they're active, they want to move. They're easily excited. They want to move around. Sometimes they literally cannot sit still. 
So how do we do with, how do we deal with this? Well, we need to make sure we're on to our second point that our lessons are active and hands on. So it's over to you in the chat box again, please. I would like to know how do you keep your young learners active? How do you get your young learners to be active and moving during your lessons? Aha, uh -huh. so we've got someone who dances, yep. Lots of TPR. A bit of TPR there. Uh huh. Action songs, movement to songs, drama, mm -hmm. music, games, song and dance, chanting and singing. Ah, manipulating small objects. That's an interesting point. Yes, yeah, so it's not just big whole body movement. We're going to talk about this in a moment. It's also it also can be smaller movements as well. Art and crafts, team games, role playing, mime. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, so lots of different activities there. Thank you. OK, so there's really two different ways that we can make our lessons active and hands on. And the first of these ways is with the materials that we use. We can use realia and flashcards, for example. So this gives students opportunities to manipulate objects and to be literally hands on with the material that they are learning. Teachers books often have suggestions for how we can use realia in class or games and activities that we can do using flashcards. But I'm sure that many of you also have your own ideas and your own favourite things to do with realia and flashcards. These are ways that we can encourage our students to relate language to the real world, particularly with realia, it brings it to life. It's not just something that we see in a book or in a picture, it's actually a real object of some kind. And by using either realia or flashcards, it's an exciting, memorable way to present vocabulary as well. It makes things a little bit more interesting than just using pictures or descriptions to clarify what words mean. Now, the second way that we can make our lessons active and hands on for our students is by the activities that we do. So both Look and Our World Second Edition have got lots and lots of occasions to encourage students to get up and move around the classroom. It might be through participating in games or acting out different situations. We can do activities such as TPR, which lots of people have suggested using. So where we associate particular words or phrases with gestures. We ask our students to use the gesture or to show us physically what we're meaning. We can use active wiggle breaks or wriggle breaks. So this is something that's particularly important if you find yourself still teaching online or teaching online some of the time at the moment, making sure that we're giving our students an opportunity to get up and physically move around and just shake off some of that kind of blah, I've been sitting down lots of the time feeling can also be really useful if you've got students who have come from several different lessons already, who are tired, who are maybe a bit lethargic, a bit lazy, and a bit lacking in energy. And we want to get that energy level back up again. So this could be something as simple as doing something like asking them to follow a simple series of TPR type instructions. So everyone stand up, put your hands on your head, turn around, touch the floor, that kind of thing. It could be as simple as putting a song on and giving everyone a very quick dance break, for example. We can be creative about when we use movement. So we could use movement, for example, in checking the answer to an activity. So I think that might be possibly what Katarzyna is, is getting at in her suggestion there about the saying A, raise your hand, B, raise your leg. We can use movement 
to get our students to signify something. If, for example, we're going through the answers to a true or false activity, we could ask everyone, if you think it's true, stand up. If you think it's false, sit down, for example. We're still going through the answers, but we're getting a little bit of movement in there as well. Equally, if we're introducing and practicing new vocabulary, we could get our students to come up with actions to symbolize each of the new words. Or if we're doing a song, can they come up with actions to go with the song? It's important to make sure that we lead by example. So we need to make sure that we ourselves are not ashamed to get join, to join in and encourage our students with those things as well. And we can encourage our students to personalize what they're learning. So again, not just coming up with all of the actions or the activities or the movement ourselves, but giving our students the opportunity as well. Um, someone just said, play Simon Says in the chat, I really like Simon Says, especially if we give our students the opportunity to be the teacher there as well. We can give our students the opportunity to be the teacher if they're working in pairs or have one student take on the role of teacher for the whole group. It gives students a sense of responsibility and it can be a great way of engaging students who are maybe not very interested or not very confident but it also lets them be more involved in and take responsibility for their learning. Of course, we can also play games with our students. Games are a fantastic way of getting our students up and moving around, but they're also fantastic in so many different ways. They bring language to life. They provide reasons to use English. And again, that's something else we're going to be speaking about a little bit later. They help our students to memorize and then they help them to learn the new content and the new language. And they can be really helpful for us as well in terms of classroom management. If we've got students that we need to be careful that we control their energy levels, that we don't get things like things get out of hand, um, that they tend to get a little bit too excited at times, games can be really helpful in making sure that we manage that. And of course, as we've said before as well, games are fun and that's really, really important for our students. So it could be things like board games. They're here are just a few examples. But remember as well, you could encourage your students to create their own game. You could get them as a good end of term or end of year revision activity to get them to create their own board game. They come up with questions. They need to draw out the board and then they can play their game in groups or swap their game with another small group and play each other's games that they've created. There's also lots and lots of different games that we can access by using technology. So I've just got a few examples here. These are from the classroom presentation tool and online practice for our world second edition. So the course book that you're using may well have games that are part of the interactive whiteboard software, or it may have an online practice app that has games as part of it. But there are also lots of other games that you can find online as well, or things like Kahoot and Quizlet, which allow you to create your own quiz type games to play with your students. Just a little note on this. Of course, we all know that if we only play games in our lesson, our students tend to get a little bit too excited. And that can be a challenge from a classroom management point of view. So remember that we can also use games to settle our students, not just to get them excited and hyped up and moving around and having lots of energy. This could be things like having puzzles for them to work on or doing a quiz or miming type activities, for example. There are still ways that our students can take part in games and have fun, but they're things that are a little bit more sedate than other activities. And they can be a balance between the two of them. Now, our third point 
that we want to make sure is that our lessons are supportive and scaffolded. Now, why is this? Well, research has shown that students will learn better and they will engage more in an environment where they feel supported, comfortable and safe. So in order to help achieve this, we need to create supportive and scaffolded lessons. So here are seven different concepts that are all something to do with things that we do in our lessons. But what I'd like you to tell me is which of these seven things fall under the definition of scaffolding? Which of these seven things are an example of scaffolding in our lessons? Okay, so we've got four, six, seven, yep. Yeah. Number four, yep. Yeah. Any others? One, three, and four, yep. Yeah. Number five, yep. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh, yep, yeah, I think everyone might have got that. So this is a little bit of a trick question, I'm being mean. They actually all come under scaffolding. So all of these things are things that we can do to provide our students with that extra support, with that extra scaffolding that will help them to achieve what we want them to achieve in our lessons. So here are just some examples of ways that we can do this. So the first thing here, if we look at this page, we've got another reading lesson with potentially quite a long text, depending on the level of our students. But we've got at the very beginning this listen and read. Now we see this all the time in our course books, don't we? Listen and read, listen and read. And often I think it's something that we just take for granted, but actually this can be a really useful tool in terms of providing extra support for our learners. If we've got students who are a little bit weaker, it can be really helpful to encourage them to listen and read at the same time, because it means that they will be reading at the same speed as their classmates. And it gives them extra support as well. If they're having difficulty decoding a particular word, they're not quite sure what this word actually says. They're not sure how it's pronounced. Listen and read can give us some extra support there. We also got carefully staged activities. You'll see there we're focusing on key vocabulary before we move into the more general reading activities and the more general reading questions. You'll also notice there that for this activity, you're going to work with a partner. So again, we're providing the opportunity for weaker students to have a bit more support. They don't have to do it all on their own. They can work with a classmate. This is something that we could do by asking our students to do it on their own initially, and then checking their answers with a partner or going through it with a partner to see if they agree on their ideas. Now, there's also visual support on the page, and this is something to make sure that we don't overlook. You've got some of the pictures from Leonardo da Vinci's inventions, but also at the bottom of the page, you've got the timeline, you've got the visual demonstration of Leonardo da Vinci's life on that timeline along the bottom of the page. And we've also got a personalization activity. So the reason I wanted to share these particular activities with you is you'll notice that these are some, in some ways a little bit different to tasks that we tend to do in reading lessons because they're much more wide in terms of their scope. The first one of these students are going to choose an invention of their own and draw it in the same style as the Inardis works and add labels. So that's a very creative task there. We've got 
The second task is writing a short play and working in a small group to act it out. And the third one is perhaps a more traditional, creating a poster and labelling similarities and differences between the past and now. But this element of student choice can be really important in creating a scaffolded and supportive environment. We're allowing students who have strengths perhaps other than their English language learning skills to come to the fore. We're allowing students to work in groups rather than necessarily individually to again allow our stronger students to support our weaker ones. And we're developing their autonomy as well by encouraging them to choose which of these activities they want to do. Now, I wanted to share some more examples with you, um, simply because of the fact that this is another area where it's really important that we do scaffold and we are supportive for our students. So obviously, in many cases, when we think of being supportive, we think of praising our students, of rewarding them, of encouraging them um, by giving them that verbal praise for what we're doing in class or maybe some kind of sticker or small physical reward. But there are other things and other activities that we can do to encourage our students to be more confident and to feel more supported in our lessons. So the examples I'm just going to share with you quickly are from our series Look, which is designed to prepare students for young learner exams, such as the Cambridge English Starters, Movers and Flyers. But you'll see here with these activities that are suggested, they're things that are going to encourage our students to practice the skills they need in exams, but in a very familiar setting. So they're going to personalise what they're looking at, or they're going to help a classmate, for example, or Maybe they're going to do an activity that they've already done, but they're going to do it again and see if they can build on it and improve upon it. Also in Look, I just wanted to share a few more examples. We've got some formative assessment framework here, which is designed to help teachers. I'm just gonna pull that up a little bit bigger there just because it gives you a bit more information, but we can see for this, that there are suggested assessment activities. So we can see how our students are performing. Then there are remedial activities. So we know what to do if our students need a little bit more support or a little bit more help with the topic. And then another assessment activity. So we can review and we can get more information for us as teachers to help us to inform our lessons and make sure that we're gauging things at the right level for our students so that it's appropriate for them. And the student progress log there just to record that information. Okay, now the next of our best practices is that we want our lessons to be meaningful and purposeful. Now we all know, don't we, that teaching young learners is just not the same as teaching adults. Whereas adults may want to see written formulae and explanations, and they might be happy completing grammar or written exercises, with young learners, it's a bit different. They're still learning to understand abstract concepts. And that includes the meta language that we often talk, use to talk about grammar. They'd rather use the language in a practical context than create complete boring exercises. Now, in her article, Teaching Languages to Young Learners, Lynn Cameron provides this description of how children learn foreign languages. So we can see that she says, children see the foreign language from the inside and try to find meaning in how the language is used in action, in interaction and with intention, rather than from the outside as a system and a form. Now, I really like this quote, but it takes quite a lot of unpacking it to understand. So we're just going to look quickly at what this means for us when we are in the classroom. So these are some definitions on the left here that Lynn mentions. And on the right, 
there are some activities that relate to them. So you've got the concepts on the left and the activities on the right. So if we just do the first one together. So when she says that children learn a language from the inside, what she means by that is that we are teaching language through meaningful context, through things that make sense to our learners. OK, does anyone have any ideas about number two from the outside? What does that mean here? So from the inside is teaching language through meaningful contexts. She said this is what children do. From the outside, this is how she, he says that children don't really learn languages. Okay, most people are saying E. Yes, you're right, it is E. So they, most children don't learn language by things like teaching grammar rules explicitly. What about number three, in action? That one's a bit easier, I think. Three A, yep, definitely, yep. So by learning through doing things. I've just realized that it's come up with number four as well by mistake. So I've given you the odds number four already. <laughs> four is D, yes. So four is D. So activities like pair and group work. And what about number five? C, yeah, well done. So activities in which children have real reasons to use the language. So ultimately, what does all of that mean for us? Well, it means that when we are teaching our young learners, this is probably not the best way to go. What do we want to be doing instead? Well, we want to make sure that we're including activities where our students learn by doing. We're teaching the language through concepts that are meaningful. We're giving our students real authentic reasons to use the language. And we're making sure that we are giving our students opportunities to interact with each other and with the teacher as well. So how can we learn by doing, first of all? Well, first of all, we can think about how we are portraying grammar. We can make sure that we're presenting it within a natural context and encourage our learners to notice patterns and rules by themselves. We can also encourage our learners to personalise the content. It's something that we've spoken about a few times in this webinar already, but by relating it to what they know already or to their own experience, we're encouraging our learners to learn by doing. And of course, we can incorporate games and songs into our teaching because these inevitably provide a meaningful context for the language. There's a genuine reason to use the language if we are playing a game or singing a song. We can also do things like project work, for example, perhaps what we more typically think of when we think of learning by doing. It could be creating a poster, a presentation, a model, a film, a play, or something else entirely. But by creating a project, either on their own or with their classmates, we are encouraging our learners to learn by doing something. Now, it's important when teaching our young learners to include lots of pair and group work. I just included some examples here. Because at this age, our students are not only developing their English skills, they're also developing their interpersonal and social skills. And parent group work gives a great opportunity for our learners to do that. They also give our students opportunities to interact. And as we said, our learners are social. They want to talk, they want to communicate by making this an option for them. We can, we can include pair and group work. Now, we want to give our learners real reasons to use the language as well. And I just wanted to show you a brief clip here 
from looks. So we mentioned about video earlier. And one of the reasons that I wanted to share this clip with you is because it shows that language being used and then it gives our students an opportunity to respond to it. Okay, the first part of the video. Yeah. have other people in your family got? Well, my cousin likes playing computer games. She's 13. Do you like doing that? Yes, I mean, I like it, but she plays computer games a lot, and I don't think that's good. I don't play every day. What about your parents? My mom likes walking. She goes for a walk every morning, and my dad... What does my dad like doing? Uh, nothing really. He likes reading the news on his phone. What hobbies have other people in your family got? My cousin likes doing jigsaws, but he doesn't like doing other puzzles. Do you like doing that? Doing puzzles? Yes, it's fun. My mum likes doing them, and I help her. What about your mum and dad? My dad likes cooking, and my mum likes reading. What hobbies have... Okay, I'm going to stop it there just because I'm conscious of time available to us, and I don't want to keep you for too much longer. But I want to share that with you because these questions that the children are being asked in the video are something that we could easily ask our students after they've watched the video and done the activities in the lesson. We're creating that interaction. They're not only able to interact in some ways with the other students in their class, but they can also see what these other children from all around the world are doing or learn about them and their lives. And then we can encourage them to answer these questions for them or to create their own video even of them answering these questions and telling their classmates about themselves and about their lives. Okay, now our final um, best practice for today is this connected to the real world. Now, our young learners, are quite egocentric. This is no fault of their own. It's a natural stage of child development. And they're also naturally curious. But how can we harness this curiosity to make our young learner lessons the best they can be? Well, firstly, we can choose topics that they can relate to, which are relevant to them and to their lives. So it could be talking about their family, where they live, free time, all of those other topics that we've been talking about today. But I've got a question for you. How do you use real world content to teach your young learners English? What do you already do to use real world content in this setting? Aha, uh -huh. yep, so we can talk about their favourite YouTubers, definitely. So yeah, if your students have got something they're really passionate about, that they're really interested in, we can definitely make use of that and bring that into our classroom. We can bring in Realia, yeah, we do show and tell. Oh, I like that idea. We watch the weather forecast three times a week on the BBC. So yeah, we can bring things that are real into our classroom very definitely by making use of technology and different things that we can watch. Uh-huh, yep, so you can talk about your own experience as well, definitely. Observations, yep. Yeah. Brilliant, okay, thank you for all of these ideas. So give them real articles or parts of books, 
Definitely, yes. So there's lots of different ways that we can bring in that real world content. We can think about the topics that we are using, the meaningful context the students can understand, they can relate to, and which they have been in themselves. This gives our students extra support when it comes to understanding and making use of the new language. Because as we said, it's important that they can relate new language to their own experience and use things that they already know about. We can also make use of other things as well. We can have things that are very different and not necessarily situations that our students will have experienced, but we can still encourage our students to relate to it. We can ask them things about, for example, school subjects or things that they might be studying in other lessons, for example. And we can encourage them to relate whatever we're studying, whatever they're reading about, whatever they're learning, to their own experience. By doing that, we're building their critical thinking skills. We're encouraging them to look for similarities and differences. So before we finish today, just to recap. So those five different best practices that we've looked at, we need to make sure that our lessons are enjoyable and interesting, that they are active and hands-on, that they are supportive and scaffolded, they are meaningful and purposeful, and they are connected to the real world. So I hope that some of the ideas that we've shared in the session today are useful to you and they've given you some ideas for things that you can go away and do with your learners, maybe, maybe in the coming days or in the coming weeks. Just to finish, if you want any more information about either of the series that we've looked at today, um, the first one that we were sharing examples of was Our World Second Edition. And I've put the web address for that series on this slide here. So you can see, you can go there, you can find sample pages that you can download and lots more information about the series. So that's eltngl.com forward slash our world 2e. The second series that we looked at today was called Look. That's the one with the videos from the children all around the world. And that one you can find more information about that series and sample pages and other information at eltngl.com forward slash look. Now as Natalia mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions about either of the series that we've looked at today, or you'd like to know anything else about National Geographic Learning, or there's anything else that we can help you with, my lovely colleagues at Novera are more than happy to help. Um, there's a slide here with some of their contact details and the website that Natalia mentioned at the beginning the ng, ng learning.pl is at the bottom of the slide there.